Hello everybody, Timothy here with Mana Rocks, and today we're taking on what I consider to be the top 10 most frustrating, headache-inducing cards that people play in Commander. This isn't necessarily a list of intentionally broken chaos cards, but rather a list of cards that cause logistical problems, slow the game down to a snail's pace, or ask players to keep track of too many things at once. Before we get into the list, feel free to subscribe below for more Magic content, and find us on Twitter at MTG underscore Mana Rocks. Let's start off with some honorable mentions. These aren't too bad, they're just tedious. The first one leads to one of the most commonly asked questions in EDH. Did you pay one? Ristic Study is an enchantment that lets you draw a card whenever an opponent casts a spell and lists they pay an additional mana for that spell. Pretty straightforward effect overall, but what actually happens is that you play your turn out like normal, and then halfway through the next player's turn, the Ristic Studies controller says, oh yeah, did you pay for all your Ristic Study triggers last turn? No sir, I did not. It's your responsibility to remind me. See, it's lose-lose with this card. Either they forget about the triggers and remember them at some inopportune time, or they remember every time and keep asking, did you pay one? Did you pay one? Did you pay one? It's a real headache. And don't even get me started on playing with this card online, where the mandatory trigger pops up every single card that gets cast. Smother and Tithe is the new Ristic Study, as far as annoying triggers are concerned, but at least that one's easy to rectify if you remember it later on. Ristic Study leads to annoying situations where they draw cards and it actually changes what would have happened that turn. It's a good card, don't get me wrong, just tedious in the hands of a forgetful player. Storm decks tend to already lead to fairly long, uninteractive games of Commander, but when you're playing against Tryhard Timmy and they end their combo with Mind's Desire, it's just add an insult to injury. Mind's Desire is a 6 mana sorcery that shuffles your library, exiles the top card, and lets you play that card for free that turn. The kicker is that it has Storm, so you get to repeat this for every spell cast before the Mind's Desire that turn. The effect of the card isn't the problem though, it's the shuffling. Each copy of Mind's Desire asks you to shuffle first, and Try Hard Timmy loves shuffling his library. See, most groups will shortcut this and say, look, I don't know any information about the top of my deck, I'll just take the top X cards of my library and use those, and most people are fine with that. But there's always that one guy who says, nope, the card says shuffle, so we're shuffling. You haven't experienced true boredom until you've watched someone cast a Mind's Desire with a storm count of 20 who insists that they shuffle between each copy. Play this card if you want to, but don't be a tryhard Timmy, just take the shortcut. The final honorable mention goes to one of the most powerful EDH cards printed in recent years. Teferi's Protection is perhaps the ultimate protection spell, literally removing you from the game and making it nearly impossible for you to die the turn you cast it. But please tell me why someone at Wizards decided it was okay to print a card with phasing on it in the 21st century. Teferi's Protection has a fairly straightforward effect. But phasing always leads to some interaction that makes people scratch their heads and pull out their smartphones to look up some ruin on the card. Have you seen the gatherer ruin on this card? No, seriously, go look up how many rules there are for Teferi's protection on gatherer. It's ridiculous. It's like trying to explain banding to someone who doesn't know how it works, except worse because it's such a universally played commander staple at this point. Don't cut Teferi's Protection from your deck, it's fantastic, just make sure you have the comprehensive rules for phasing ready when you're about to cast it. Moving into our actual list, number one is the inspiration for making this list, as it's one of the most frustrating cards that people sometimes play in EDH, and it leads to some serious nonsense rule breaking. Eye of the Storm is a 7 mana enchantment that says whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery, exile it, then that player copies each of the other spells exiled with Eye of the Storm. So what happens is Eye of the Storm starts accumulating instants and sorceries underneath it, and each new instant or sorcery that gets cast gets turned into a bunch of copies of the other spells instead. The stack gets larger and larger, and Eye of the Storm becomes the focus of the game, with players trying to cast whatever spells they can just to get an explosion of spells off of the enchantment. The problem is that people do not want to take the time to actually put all of those copies on the stack, choose targets, and resolve them in the proper order. Nope, they just cast a spell and start drawing cards and blowing up permanents and gaining life and whatever else is under there. Then before they've even resolved half of their copies, some other guy jumps in with his instant and starts casting copies left and right and drawing cards and blowing up permanents, and the first guy hasn't even finished stacking his triggers yet. It all just gets completely out of hand. 
And to make matters worse, someone always has to cast a counter spell somewhere in the middle of all of this, so now anytime someone casts an instant or sorcery, there's a bunch of copies of spells on the stacks, one of which is a counter spell, and people will just start having random counters attached to all their instants. Seriously, it's a total mess, and people just do whatever they want when this thing's out. I actively tell people not to play this unless they're going to take the time to have everyone stack triggers and observe priority, but that's just not how most groups play. So, here we are. Stay away from this, please. Back in 2007, Magic had their grand creature type update, where they updated the oracle text of every single creature to more reflect what it was supposed to be. This leads to some awkward type lines on creature cards, where some physical magic cards are either missing a creature type that has been added to it, or the creature type has changed altogether. Regal Behemoth says lizard on the card, but it's not a lizard, it's a dinosaur. You'd never know that unless someone told you or you've looked up the oracle text. Nothing makes me look up oracle text more than our number two card, Coat of Arms. I hope you know exactly what creature types every creature on the board has, because Coat of Arms says you have to. This artifact gives each creature plus one plus one for every other creature on board that shares at least one type with it. I mean, the card literally has reminder text in parentheses to highlight how dumb it is. Clearly, this is a payoff for tribal decks, given all of your creatures huge power bumps if you have a bunch of them on board, but it counts everything on board. And there are some truly egregious creature types out there. I mean, have you even heard of the Simic Guild? Have you ever played a coat of arms while someone has a coiling oracle on board? Now you're responsible for keeping track of every single snake, every single elf, and every single druid on board. And the pumps aren't even symmetrical. If I have a coiling oracle, one other snake, one other elf, and one other druid on board, the oracle gets plus three plus three, and the others all get plus one plus one. And you have to do this math for literally every creature on the board. It never fails that someone forgets about some subtype that completely changes the landscape of the board, and once you've figured it all out, Tribal Tommy comes out of nowhere and says, hey guys, did you know Electrite has been eroded to a beast trilobite? And you've got to start back from square one. What a pain. God forbid someone throws down a changeling, which basically adds a sweep in plus one plus one to everything, but gets plus one plus one itself equal to the number of other creatures on the board. My hope is that when someone plays Coat of Arms, I just die that turn and I don't have to do the math anymore. And honestly, that's usually what happens. I remember back in the days of Dragons of Tarkir draft, I opened a foil clone legion and I ran it in my limited deck, copied a couple dragons that my opponent had, and walked away thinking, hey, that was pretty cool, this would be an awesome EDH card. So I cast it in commander and my head exploded. Clone legion is one of those potential logistical nightmare cards. For 9 mana, you make a token copy of each creature that target player controls. Simple, sweet, what's not to like? Well, how about when Jimmy has 14 creatures on board? You clone Legion, target and Jimmy, you whip out a bunch of dice or tip cards to represent your 14 new tokens, the game goes on for a couple more turns and wait a second, what was this token again? How many of these did I have? Hey Jimmy, was that creature on board when I cast Clone Legion? Alright, you see the problem? Clone Legion is simple in concept, but the headache comes in physically representing each token on the battlefield. The smart thing to do would be to write down the names of each creature you copied on some scrap paper and use those, but let's be real, who's going to take the time to do that? Not me! So, while you might be able to figure out what's what when you cast the Clone Legion, it's inevitable that something gets moved around or mixed up and everyone ends up forgetting what's left and which copies are already dead. The most horrendous experience with this card was casting it against a Sliver player while they had 15 different Slivers out. All of the slivers started pumping each other, some of them started blowing each other up, and while we were losing track of everything, we remember that Sliver Overlord has the ability to steal other slivers. So now the tokens were actually swapping from player to player, and if memory serves correctly, we both just conceded and moved on to another game. Save Clone Legion for Magic Online, where all of the work keeping track of what's what is done for you. For such a simple game and concept, Magic has a staggering amount of complexity to it. Thankfully, Magic has a built-in priority system that makes casting spells and resolving abilities tick like clockwork. Unfortunately, many players don't understand the concept of priority, but don't worry, because number 4 on our list, Living Death, is here to brute force you into a situation where you have no choice but to figure out how the stack works and how priority fits in. There's a couple other cards that have similar sweeping effects like Live and Death, but there's nothing quite as enlightening as every player in a four-man game simultaneously reanimating 10 creatures from their graveyard. 
See, with a card like Rise from the Dark Realms, sure, a bunch of creatures all hit the board at the same time, but it's all under one player's control, so it usually boils down to stacking and resolving ETB triggers. With a Living Death, the creatures are usually coming in under a bunch of different players' controls, and all the triggers go on the stack in turn order and resolve in reverse turn order. The problem is similar to Eye of the Storm. People just start doing whatever their cards say without going through the motions of resolving the stack correctly. Players ignore the fact that targets need to be chosen in the correct order, and something usually gets lost in translation. Live and Death is responsible for some of the most incomprehensible stacks I've ever seen in Magic, and leads to so many, oh wait, this was supposed to happen moments, that it really does get overwhelming sometimes. On top of all this, Live and Death kills off all of the creatures that were originally on board, so there are often death triggers mixed in with the new Enter the Battlefield triggers. If your playgroup isn't accustomed to the concept of the stack or priority in Magic, you might want to give them a short lecture before casting this card. Where a card like Clone Legion requires you to keep track of a bunch of physical copies of cards on the battlefield, number 5 on our list requires us to tinker with something else that EDH players are accustomed to using. Dice. Cathar's Crusade is a 5 mana enchantment that says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on all of your creatures. Sleek, easy to understand concept. You play a creature, everything gets bigger. But then there's the dice. See, everything starts off smooth. You play Cathar's Crusade, you follow up with a creature, and you put a bunch of dice on your creatures. Good job, Timmy. That was easy. No, wait, Timmy, no, what are you doing? See, when Timmy plays their second creature, that creature's going to get a counter, but all the other creatures are going to tick up, and now the dice on board are displaying different numbers. Then comes the third creature. So you have a creature with a single plus one plus one counter, a creature with two plus one plus one counters, and presumably a bunch of other creatures that now all have three plus one plus one counters. See, Coat of Arms asks you to constantly look at the board state and do math to figure out what every creature's power and toughness is. Cathar's Crusade becomes its own special hell where you're constantly manipulating dice every time a creature hits the board, and the numbers end up all over the place. It's not uncommon for a token deck to have seven or more Sapperling tokens, all with a different number of plus one plus one counters. And eventually, you have to whip out the d20. And dear god, not the d20s, Timmy. Good news is that once Cathar's Crusade has stripped you of your sanity and left you with a permanent repetitive stress injury from non-stop manipulation of dice, the player usually drops something like Avenger of Zendikar and kills everyone. So, at least there's a silver lining. Here's a fun magic fact for you. When a creature has a star or asterisk in its power or toughness, we refer to that as a CDP or Characteristic Defining Ability. That means that the star will be defined in the creature's rules text, and that number will constantly change depending on what that CDP refers to. For example, a card like Overbeing of Myth defines its power and toughness as the number of cards in your hand. Easy, count the cards, and boom, power and toughness. Then there's number six, Lord of Extinction, Lord of Extinction is a 5-mana Golgari Elemental with one such CDP, defined by the number of all cards in all players' graveyards. Oh, Tim, you poor thing. Don't you know how to count? Didn't you go to elementary school? It's not that bad. First off, no I can't, no I didn't, and yes, it is that bad. See, the problem here is that in a 4-person EDH game, creatures are constantly dying, instants and sorceries are getting cast, and Tommy's over there milling people with Hedron Crab. On top of that, cards constantly leave the graveyard, whether it's from someone getting bajuka bogged, a Diluvian Primordial casting spells out of the graveyard, or Tommy reanimating his Hedron Crab. Lord of Extinction changes power and toughness every time one of these game actions happen, and it's not uncommon for this card's stat line to change four or five times in a single turn cycle. It's like a little kid in a grocery store hyped on Mountain Dew. It can't stay still, it's always moving around, and it's annoying. Lord of Extinction and similar cards like Night Howler or Consume an Aberration produce this little mini game where players have to collectively count how many cards they've got in the bin and add them all up. And then the Lord of Extinction usually kills someone, that player leaves the game, and now we have to recount how many cards are left for the remaining players. I like to take a shortcut when someone plays a card like this, where I'll count how many cards are in my graveyard and I'll put a die on top of the graveyard to represent the number, then I'll change the die whenever something changes with my graveyard. Moral of the story is that counting sucks and being asked to do it over and over again is just tedious. I'm not personally a big fan of chaos cards unless they serve some sort of purpose in the player's deck. 
Chaos for the sake of chaos is not fun. It's random nonsense and it's not why I play Magic, but sometimes they fit the theme of a deck and that I'm okay with. One such chaos card is Possibility Storm, which has a home in decks that just care about cast and spells. Things like Vile Smasher, Zada, Hedron Grinder, and Caravec the Merciless can play this card to good effect. Here's what happens. For 5 mana, you get an enchantment that says whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, they exile it and dig through their library until they hit a spell that shares a type with it, and they cast that instead. So if I cast an artifact, I essentially get the first artifact that pops up from my deck instead. This usually incentivizes players to cast their cheapest spells in hopes of turning them into more explosive, impactful spells from their library. Or sometimes they cast an instant and possibility storm into a counterspell, and they just waste their card. It happens. There are two problems, though. The first is that when people play this card just for the sake of making the game chaotic, it's hard for anyone, even the card's owner, to form any sort of plan. Everyone's just casting whatever and hitting cards at random, and it feels more like a game of plane chase than a full-on EDH game. The real problem, and the reason it makes this list, is because it makes the game last forever. And I mean literally forever. I am currently still playing the first game that someone resolved a possibility storm in while I'm writing this script. Okay, so the real issue is that you can't shortcut this one. You have to flip one card at a time until you find a hit, and sometimes you dig through 30 or more cards until you hit something. And this happens with every single spell. It gets monotonous after a while, and there comes a point where players are just cycling through their library for the fourth time just hoping someone will get the possibility storm off board so they can play real magic again. Look, play this if it fits the theme of your deck, but make sure there's some payoff for doing so. Number 8 on our list is possibly one of the most played cards in EDH, held off only by a somewhat prohibitive cost for budget players. Sensei's Divine and Top is a fantastic card, a staple that fits into literally any deck, and one that has my double thumbs up seal of approval. But be careful lest the top fall into the hands of the wrong player. Sensei's Divine and Top was banned in Legacy back in April 2017 because, and I'm quoting directly from the banned and restricted announcement, the necessity of repeated top activations to play the card slows down match play and leads to tournament delays. Did you hear that? <laughs> they banned top because people were taking too long figuring out what to do with their cards. And while I think commander players generally know when to activate top, there's always that one player who has to constantly activate their top three or four times in a single turn cycle. Now, the shortcut that most people do is just to tell everyone they're topping while someone else is playing through their turn, and it'll be done and over with by the time it gets to them. But some of the spikier players, and I'm guilty of this myself, will wait until right before their turn to top. Technically, this is the best time to do it, but in a casual EDH game, it just makes the turns last longer. So I'm not knocking the top here. The top didn't do anything wrong. I'm just urging players to get in the groove of topping before it gets to your turn for smoother gameplay. Just remember the motto, friends, don't let friends top on end step. Do you guys remember that scene from the movie 300 where they block out the sun with arrows? Okay, well, imagine that, but instead of arrows, it's birds. And instead of a bunch of Spartan warriors, it's a bunch of middle-aged EDH players wildly swinging spells into an onboard Dovescape. Dovescape is a 6-mana Azorius enchantment that says whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, counter it, then that player puts 1-1 one, one flying birds onto the battlefield equal to the countered spell's converted mana cost. Basically, in simple terms, all your spells are birds. Dovescape combines a bunch of complaints that I brought up with other cards. It slows the game down because everyone is flooding the board with 1-1 one, one birds, and basically nothing else is happening. It makes it hard to enact any real game plan that relies on non-creature spells, and it usually requires a bunch of physical tokens to keep track of on board. Dovescape is the pinnacle of just saying no to everything your opponents play, and they need a creature like Reclamation Sage to get out from underneath it. Dovescape is usually run alongside cards like Tygum or Sphinx of the Final Word, which lets you get birds from Dovescape, but prevent your spells from being countered, so you get to break parity while your opponents suffer the wrath of 1,000 beating wings. I feel like there's an unwritten rule that when someone resolves a Dovescape, it's every other player's responsibility to form a temporary alliance and try to outbird the Dovescape player. This is another enchantment where I urge people to have a plan when they play it. Don't just do it to annoy people. And we finally get to number 10, a true testament to the tilting nature of player decisions in a typical game of EDH. 
the number 10 spot belongs to the entire tempting offer cycle from Commander 2013. I want to take a brief moment to congratulate whoever came up with the name Tempting Offer for this cycle because it might be the most aptly named multiplayer mechanic in all of Magic. Each Tempt and Offer card gives you a small effect, then asks each other player if they want to take the same effect. For each player who takes the offer, you get to repeat the effect for yourself. The biggest offender is the green one, Tempt with Discovery. You fetch a land, untapped, any land, not a basic, then for each player who wants to fetch up a land of their own, you get another one. What attempt an offer, right? Most savvy groups will all team up and say no, or collectively get lands that can destroy the lands that the caster gets to keep them in check, but where this card becomes a headache is when someone plays it against a less savvy group. Jimmy casts attempt with discovery. I immediately say no thanks, and then the other two players are like, hell yeah I want a land, gee thanks Jimmy. Jimmy fetches Urzatron from his deck and proceeds to kill everyone at the table. See, it sounds like everyone benefits. If I said to a group of friends, look guys, I can get a dollar, then each of you can get a dollar, and for everyone who takes one, I'll get another dollar. There's literally no downside for anyone, so it sounds good and everyone says yes. But tempting offer is more along the lines of, I get a dollar, then you take a dollar, so I get another dollar, and then I kill you and take your dollar. And the green one preys on people who are mana screwed. Sometimes they have to take the land just to play the game, and the green player gets so far ahead on mana that they're out of control. Again, in a group of well-knowledge players, this isn't usually a problem, but it's frustrating when people just snap up the offer and the caster spirals out of control. If you take the offer, have a game plan, or just say no. Alright folks, that's going to bring this list to a close. What do you think? Are there cards that show up in your playgroup that cause you headaches? Or are the cards on my list not as bad as I make them out to be? Let me know in the comments below, and let me know if you have any ideas for top 10 lists. I'd love to hear from you all. Before we go, feel free to subscribe to Mana Rocks below for more Magic content, or find us on Twitter at MTG underscore Mana Rocks. And thank you for hanging out. We'll see you guys next time.